One Piece Chapter 1082, titled Let's Go and Claim It, features a silly cover page of Chopper mistaking Zeus for his favorite food, cotton candy, and taking a huge bite out of him. This is the second silly cover page recently to feature Big Mom's homies. With Chapter 1079, we saw what looked to be like Prometheus watching Luffy. And this time, he's checking in on Chopper and his old buddy Zeus. This could very well be Oda teasing the return of Big Mom for us here. But as we await the return of a former Yonko, it's time to enjoy a chapter centered around the legendary pirate that replaced her. To begin, we kick off with the sudden and shocking death of Marine Vice Admiral T-Bone. We first met the guy when he was a rear admiral back during Water 7. And until now, the man famous for slicing ships apart had been steadily climbing the ranks. Adored by many, the news of such a high-profile death among the Marines was nothing short of unbelievable. And to make matters worse, the Marines refused to comment on the circumstances of his demise, which is never a good sign. Back at Marine headquarters, former Fleet Admiral Sengoku was in the midst of conversation with Vice Admiral Suru, wondering if the man responsible had been captured yet. Unfortunately for them, Suru would confirm that they hadn't. However, she was pretty sure that the criminal's family would be pretty well off because of this, which I promise will make more sense in a second. Sengoku, in the midst of chewing, would begin to wonder what was becoming of the world in modern times, that the very civilians they'd sworn to protect were turning against them and even stabbing them in the back. As unlike in our world, such a thing was completely unfathomable. And at that, we now know that the culprit was actually just an ordinary citizen. As she cooled her tea in this navy cafeteria, Suru would explain to her old friend that pirates aren't the only ones interested in financial gain. That considering marines now have bounties too thanks to the recently established cross guild organization, it was only natural that they'd get a taste of their own medicine and be hunted down as well. She'd take this point a step further by expressing that when it comes to islands like Pepe Kingdom, where starvation claims the lives of thousands on a yearly basis, she can see why someone like T-Bone was killed in such a place. That for those without options in the face of certain poverty, the promise of sudden wealth for doing this sort of thing would be all too tempting. And in that sense, I can totally understand why the Marines decided to keep this information away from the public. But since they're talking about all this in the open, it must not be a secret that's too closely guarded. The One Piece world is full of injustice, turmoil, and strife despite the global efforts of the Marines. But now, failure to appease the people could very well result in fatality, as it has in the case of T-Bone. Suru would be quick to make it clear that she wasn't trying to defend the newly established criminal. Only that if this is what Buggy had in mind by doing all this, then the Marines made a terrible mistake in underestimating him. And when you really think about it, the Marines have been fumbling pretty terribly over the last few years. Then Goku would begin to wonder how they could ever protect and serve if they have to watch their backs when it comes to these very same people. He'd make it very clear here that if they don't deal with Cross Guild quickly, this precedent will kill the morale of the entire Navy and severely weaken them. They've had Yonko before but the threat posed by Buggy and his forces was unlike any they'd ever experienced before. One that hit them where it hurts. Past this, Sengoku would call out to Rear Admiral Hina, wondering if she'd seen Garp. After all, there was a new flavor of rice cracker that he wanted him to try. And suddenly, this serious conversation feels like it's being held in a retirement home. Hina, meanwhile, would casually inform her seniors that a few days ago, Garp said he was off to save Kobe, meaning he likely teamed up with Sword which he did. She was also pretty sure that Suru's granddaughter, Rear Admiral Kujaku, was with him, which she is. The two marine legends could not believe their ears. The sheer thought that they had invaded Blackbeard's territory was too much to bear. But from there, we leave marine headquarters and head on over to Empty Bluffs Island. Here inside the big top, Buggy was in the midst of praising someone for having crossed the seas to make it here, which would be met with a shaky sense of gratitude. They'd then be told to be proud of what they'd done because these so-called emperors of the underworld were smiling because of them. That everyone proclaimed this to be the birth of a new star and champion of evil. But one good look would make it all too clear that this likely wasn't the case. The nervous wreck of a man, despite his fear, was very grateful to Buggy for giving the money he'd earned to his family. So yeah, this is our headlining marine killer. And man, if I couldn't see this guy for myself, I might even be sold by Buggy's words as he praised the killer for taking down one of the Navy's finest officers. Before a hearty laugh, he'd even call the man evil charisma in the flesh. Calling it a crazy stunt, Buggy was sure that the Marines would slaughter the man for what he'd done if he'd ever been caught. 
But despite this, thinking back to his ailing and famished family, the man didn't mind never being able to see them again if it meant he wouldn't have to watch them starve anymore. From there, Buggy would seek to ease the man's worries by welcoming him as a fellow pirate. Much of the man's uncertainty. From there, he'd be crowded around by some other dastardly fellows. One would explain to him that Buggy had decided to take him in, while another would hype Buggy up to be unlike any other pirate he's ever known. This was to be a glorious, unforgettable moment. One where he was face to face with a living legend, as they'd all continue to praise their glorious captain. From there, one of Buggy's men would interrupt with a bit of a speech quirk about him. One that had him referring to the Yonko as Barley instead of Buggy, and calling him Fresh instead of In the Flesh. A guy, and Buggy wasn't very fond of sounding like a breakfast cereal. But this was it, Cross Guild's flagship had finally been completed. Thinking back, Buggy convinced he likes of both Mihawk and Crocodile that he could handle the construction of their ship on account of his many talented shipwrights. And boy oh boy, what a glorious ship indeed. These dedicated souls felt it was only right to have a figurehead representative of their illustrious chairman. And it's instantly my new favorite ship. Sorry, Sonny. But Buggy clearly wasn't as enthusiastic. And with the likes of Crocodile and Mihawk behind him even less enthused, Buggy presented us with a one-of-a-kind expression that perfectly reflected the pain he knew was on the way. And yet again, when they decided to take things to the meeting room. Seriously, how can you not love this guy? He is the best. A celebration would be held for the unveiling of this marvelous vessel as Cross Guild's leading faces convened inside the meeting room where Buggy's cries of pain were all too audible. Inside, as Buggy's severed head hung from a hook that wasn't Crocodile's, the very same sand user would declare that public awareness of the organization was growing as intended, with the Marines finally beginning to comprehend the serious threat they pose. Buggy would call for death to save him from the pain I presume to have been entirely dealt by Crocodile since Buggy's immune to sword attacks. And the idea of Mihawk attacking without a blade is just wrong. Anyways, Crocodile would additionally make it clear that what they needed was to have incomparable influence for them to form their utopia, allowing them to become a powerful military state. But before then, they needed to establish something, which Mihawk correctly presumed to be their overwhelming power. Something that isn't so new to Crocodile's list of desires, as one of the ancient weapons would certainly fit that description. But as these two continued, Buggy in his bloodied and beaten state couldn't help but feel that all this was wrong and not at all how he wanted his life to go. For the sake of establishing an overwhelming power, they need to amass a surplus of what we may presume to be weapons. But suddenly, Buggy would interject with the belief that the answer was wealth. He knew himself to be out of line with these two by saying this, but when it came to amassing wealth and power, as a former member of the Roger Pirates, these words had a resounding impact on Buggy's life and his perception of true piracy. And so despite knowing that they may very well kill him, for saying this, he couldn't help but wonder how these two could possibly consider themselves to be pirates with these sort of schemes. An unbelievable statement indeed. One that prompted Mihawk to absolutely torch him by questioning what this cockroach said. But according to Buggy, they had it all wrong. From there, we get a better look at the entire room's interior, revealing this to be less of a meeting room and more like a torture chamber with two chairs and a table. Buggy was sure that the two men were aware that Shanks was finally making his move. He'd then express that despite both being on the Pirate King's crew together, certain circumstances, namely his sudden sickness and Shanks remaining by his side, kept them from making it to Laugh Tale with all the others. With that being said, he'd wonder what these two men longed to be back then. The bombastic clown would further elaborate that when he sailed together with Shanks, the guy was so incredible and possessed such unbelievable potential that knowing he'd never be able to compare, he decided to forego his true dream. And that had to have been a painful realization and sentiment. But 24 years ago, the day their captain was executed, as it rained, Buggy would remind Shanks of his previous words. That he'd take his own crew to find the One Piece one day too. Something Buggy was betting on to be the case. Especially given the fact that they just heard the final words of their captain. But much to Buggy's shock and disappointment, Shanks had changed his mind for the time being and believed that he wasn't ready to claim the treasure just yet, despite still fully intending to become a pirate. And maybe this shift was a result of what Roger privately told him before leaving that made him cry. Regardless, Buggy truly believed in Shanks perhaps more than anyone else. So to know that he wasn't the next generation's pirate king, he felt as though he'd misjudged his comrade. 
And so when Shanks called for Buggy to join his crew, Buggy was completely against it, even going as far as to call Shanks a coward. Which is to say that if Shanks truly intended to live up to his presumed potential, Buggy would have likely joined him. I didn't think it was possible for me to have any more respect for this man, but damn, Buggy is really a top tier character. Realizing that Shanks had no intention of following in their captain's footsteps, Buggy couldn't bear to see him any longer, and instead of saying such things, would remind Shanks that it's his fault he lost a treasure map, which he hadn't forgiven him for, and that next time they meet, Shanks better watch his back. If you don't remember, Buggy planned to use the map he'd found to uncover a secret underwater treasure, become crazy rich, and form his own powerful crew. He also planned on selling his devil fruit, but when Shanks surprised him, he accidentally ate the fruit, the map went into the ocean, and he lost the ability to ever swim again. These two characters have not seen each other since Roger's execution. And although he's not all that powerful physically, Buggy at the very least has a powerful presence on the world stage, so the reunion is bound to be interesting. After all these years, Shanks was finally making his move, but it was too little, too late for Buggy. He didn't know why, but some way, somehow, thanks to sheer luck, chance, or something, the two of them, as Yonko, were both on equal footing yet again. And in that case, as he cried his eyes out, Buggy made his glorious declaration that he wants to become the King of the Pirates. Oh my goodness, who but Luffy has ever evoked such passion for the title but the magnificent, blue-haired wordsmith Buggy the Clown. The joy I felt reading this was almost tear-inducing. I am so happy, and it does not stop there. As he looked upon these two men, Mihawk and Crocodile, Buggy would continue to question their desires. Wealth? Power? Why in the world would they stop there when they can have it all? He then finally urged them to all go for it, to claim the ultimate treasure, the One Piece. And at this point, the two would finally arise and seek to quell this nonsense as Crocodile drew blood from Buggy with his hook as the clown shrieked in pain. The former Mr. Zero was astounded that Buggy seemingly bought into his own con and believed he was in any position to say these things. With this, he'd be sure to remind the clown that they were only allowing him to keep the title of Yonko and figurehead leader because it was to their benefit. While Mihawk wondered if the clown seriously believed that they were going to just carry him to the top of the world. Crocodile would go on by telling him that they weren't just playing pirate here. From his perspective, Buggy had no idea how to run a serious business, let alone formulate an actual plan. Mihawk would then wonder if Buggy honestly expected them to pick fights with Shanks, Blackbeard, and Luffy. Which is a bit hilarious coming from the man who previously battled Shanks at sea for sport, but whatever. To this, Buggy would tell them that it is a scramble for the One Piece. That they don't need to fight the others at all, they just need to beat them to it. In fact, Buggy intended to show them. According to him, there are some words that light a fire in the heart of every pirate because they all set sail for the very same reason. And with that, this madman had a transponder snail. Crying out to all their forces at the top of his lungs, Buggy, while being stomped out by Mihawk and told to stop, would question what dream drove them all out to sea. And oh my goodness, his mere words shone so brightly that some would need to shield their eyes, lest they go blind from the sheer luminosity of his voice. And listen, I don't usually do direct quotes with these videos, but I'll make a special exception for this one because I really need you to understand this. Every moment you cling to life might be your last, so why ignore that screaming urge inside you? If you gave up because the reality of it was too daunting, now's your chance. It's time for us to set sail, to reach out and grasp what we all desire most. It's time for us to finally go and claim the One Piece. As the cheers to be had would breach the heavens as powerfully as any Conqueror's Hockey Clash. To complete the trifecta of GOAT One Piece speeches alongside the legs of Goldie, Roger, and Whitebeard, Buggy had his men crying tears of joy, as one of them even looked like a knockoff combination of those two. Crocodile and Mihawk were not prepared for this, and were angrier than ever. 
But even in the face of torture and death, Buggy chose to follow his dream and inspire his men. What an absolute legend. But guys, this chapter was actually a longer one as we would swiftly transition to the Kamabaka Queendom. Here, someone would crudely wonder if the ship on its way towards them was an enemy vessel or not. We'd then be greeted by four new characters that are all vice captains of the Revolutionary Army. There's Ushiano, Morley subordinate of the West Army. Ahiru, Bellobetti subordinate of the East Army. Giambol, Lindbergh subordinate of the West Army. And Jiron, Karasu subordinate of the North Army. Ushiano is either a mink or a goofy devil fruit user. If it's a devil fruit, I'm betting on the Ushi Ushi no Mi model cow. He sounds pretty silly, so considering the sort of story One Piece can be, we can probably expect him to either have a really tragic backstory, or be stupid strong when it comes down to actually fighting. Ahiru looks like she probably has a devil fruit that's a diet mix of useless kids fruit, Mainika rest his soul, and baby fives fruit. Giambo looks like Humpty Dumpty, so he might just be the next Pedro at some point. If this is a result of a devil fruit, then it's also a prime example that you should really watch what you eat. Speaking of which, Jiron seems to be munching on something. Now maybe I'm tripping, but this guy at first glance reminded me of Sanji's siblings. I mean, he's stationed in the North Army, and the Vinsmoke family is from the North Blue. So hey, let me know if you think that makes sense or not. Anyways, Yambo was looking to bet on whether or not the ship was friend or foe. With that, binoculars in hand, Jiron would bet a million berries on it being Sabo making a safe return. And it's times like this that I wish we had an official explanation of how much a berry is actually worth in real world terms. Last thing I'll say about these guys, like when it came to all those sword member introductions, Oda is really cooking something up right now, and he is just showing us the ingredients in advance. Deeper into the island, Luffy's dad, Monkey D. Dragon, was meeting with Ivankov when news would come of Sabo's return which was a big relief to Eva, while Dragon was a bit more reserved. Which I find to be a bit interesting, given how strongly he felt about not being able to forgive Sabo if he'd actually killed Vivi's father, King Nefertari Cobra. Giambo knew that Jiron was trying to scam him out of a million berries, and so he wasn't paying at all. Jiron was willing to force it out of him, but when Giambo noticed his binoculars, he was quick to not just hide, but actually eat them. So maybe he has a diet version of Waffles fruit or something. Ahiru would shut her mechanized arm down while telling Sabo that she nearly blasted him to bits, which would be pretty impressive at that distance. Sabo was glad she didn't and would even wonder if she was worried, which she was just a bit, and it looks like Ushiano shares the same sentiment. Sabo, who might I remind you is currently heralded to be the Flame Emperor, would inform his comrades that the vessel he disembarked from was a Lelusian ship a name they recognized that belonged to a kingdom that vanished. Sabo would provide more details later, but thankfully he managed to bring along some refugees. But crying out his name, it was Koala with a flurry of swift fishman kicks as she reprimanded her comrade for failing to provide his status in the field. And as he avoided her blows with observation hockey, Sabo would apologize for not doing so. But without an encryptor transponder snail, all his calls were bound to be monitored. That being said, he did provide their usual 3-beat code to signal that he was fine. And as Koala cried and clung onto him while dragging on the ground, Sabo made it clear with a smile that he wasn't even on the island when it was decimated, which was surely a relief to Koala. From there, Morley in his flamboyant and massive style would join in with tears flooding his eyes as he welcomed his friend's safe return. Much to the horror of several onlookers. Bello Betty, meanwhile, would welcome the people of Lucia by calling them losers that have come a long way. And I feel like if they weren't on complete opposite ends of the spectrum, Betty and Rear Admiral Kujaku would really get along together. And hey, Sword is a pretty freestyle group, so who knows? Betty would acknowledge the unfortunate loss of their homes, but would highlight their interest in joining their cause. But before then, it was important for them to rest and prepare themselves for what was to come. From there, we would have a more balanced power trio than we saw earlier as Dragon, Eva, and Sabo began talking about what happened with Kuma not too long ago. But Sabo completely understood that as those previously closest to Kuma, these two were taking this outcome the hardest. Dragon would then theorize that Kuma may have been programmed with a return contingency. But considering the progression of sequential events, they have no idea that right now, 
Kuma is scaling up to Mary Joa, despite being shot at repeatedly by Marine personnel. So clearly, it is not a welcomed return. Kuma would take note of the fact that Sabo wanted to speak with them privately away from even the captains, which Sabo would confirm, as the information he prepared to share with them was enough to put their lives at risk. And it must be a big deal, considering they're all rebels anyways. And so now, he would tell them both what really happened at the Holy Land, Mary Joa. Oh my goodness, One Piece is the only series that can consistently deliver legendary chapters without even a single main cast member in sight. Because if we are immediately getting into what actually happened at the Reverie, you won't want to miss it. In the meantime, go check out our video on the top 10 strongest Logia Del fruits in One Piece history.